Christina Michelle. Uh, Professor Michelle is Professor and Center Director of Engineering in Arizona State University, USA. She is formerly the long-standing IEEE Technology and Society Magazine Editor-in-Chief from 2012 to 17, and presently an IEEE Consumer Electronics Magazine Senior Editor. In 2017, she was awarded with the prestigious brand um, O'Connell Award for Distinguished Service to the IEEE Society on the Social Implication of Technology. So I would like to welcome you, Professor, on behalf of ICFA University, Jaipur. And now I request Professor Michelle to start the session and address our participants. Thank you so much for the invitation to give this technology talk on the future of innovation in society. I am very Thank honored, you. very honored uh, for the invitation, and I have a very close proximity to Indian universities uh, and universities around all of Asia, in fact, because I have had the opportunity to travel to many destinations. And so I feel I'm coming back to a group uh, of people who understand the world quite differently to the West, despite the influence of the West. I think India uh, and the surrounding nations are coming into their own. And so my hope is today, I get you to think about technology. In fact, my talk will be deceptively, not really about technology itself, but how we think about the future of innovation in society. And I'm hoping throughout this time today, this next 40 minutes or so, that we have some interaction and discuss them. So I would like people to unmute or to write in the chat window because that will help me in the presentation. This won't be one way. So I was introduced I'm from the School for the Future of Innovation in Society. And the title of my talk is about this same topic as the school I'm part of. And the school has brought together about 38 different disciplines in its 50 staff and faculty. And so we have been thrust together in this interdisciplinarity, this transdisciplinarity, using different methodologies, different kinds of theories that we each are very uh, perhaps developed in and understand, we have an awareness of, and we are trying to create some kind of fluency between us to understand what is the other person from the other discipline talking about. So the thing that binds all of us is the future, and the thing that binds all of us is also innovation, and the fact that we acknowledge as faculty, we are part of society itself. So coming together with what I would call unorthodox strategies about the future. So we know until now that the ways forward have kept perhaps healthy, have created in us a, a hope for modern medicine and science, have created in us a hope for advancement but while our technologies are advancing quite quickly, you know, faster than Moore's law perhaps, what about the human body? What about the environment around us? What about the natural things? And this is exactly where this talk goes today in triggering thoughts about how we think about the future, each individually and as a community at ICFAI in Jaipur, but also in the world, okay? So a, a bit more about thinking about technology and its role rather than technology itself. So here's my first question to you. We're here to talk about the future, but what's the future? Uh, in the chat window, take a few moments perhaps to think about what that might be uh, and perhaps write down some of those thoughts. You can also unmute and talk to me about that. Um, the future is full of great ideas. I like this very positive response by uh, Abhishek. What is the future? Okay, it's full of great ideas. What else? What is it? 
and I'm not looking for a definition that is precise. I think technology will help us to achieve our goals. Yes, indeed. Uh, we look at the sustainable development goals, and it's exactly what we're talking about. How can we use technology as a wrapper across the 17 SDGs as defined by the United Nations and so forth? So the sustainable development goals. And today I saw a, an article titled How These 17 Sustainable Development Goals Are Unattainable. It's impossible, this article was saying. We can't do it. And yet we are saying that technology can assist us. Okay, let's go back to the question. What is the future? Okay, so we, we know that the future is full of great ideas because we're going to propose them. Uh, we know that technology will help us to achieve our goals. But what is this thing we call future? Really think about the definition. Future, what is it? Let's talk about this wonderful thing in the world. Time. Okay. Future is the time which is about to come. Fantastic. Thank you, Abhishek, for saving me today because I want this to be a discussion that you will never forget. So the future is the time which is about to come. Okay, what's the about? Tell me a time frame. About what? I think the future is new, innovative of technology. Yes, background, yes. Now let's go back to Abhishek. Future is the time which is about to come. Okay, give me a time frame. What do we mean about to come? So I think the future is new, innovative of technology. If you go to your chat window, everyone, you can see the, the responses. So Abhishek says, next few years or maybe even the decades and when i was studying innovation in theory okay the diffusion of innovation uh someone said think even about 500 years no think about five thousand years no think about five million five billion years okay but as humans when we think about the future we think usually in our lifetime or the lifetime of our children or the lifetime of our grandchildren so the future is the time when we have achieved our goals. That's our hope, that we write down our goals and then we work towards the goals using technology to achieve the goals. And as I said to you, you know, the sustainable development goals were said to be unattainable. The future is blank. Yes, it is. We have to fill it by our acts. I love this philosophy, uh, Somi. So future is blank. This is true. Nothing has been predefined as about to happen in the future. We are creating the future. So anyone who wants to look at dystopia and say the future is terrible, well, that means they feel disempowered to change the future. You know, the future hasn't happened. It's happening somewhere down the track. But we need goals. Somebody said we need goals, like sustainable development goals. So the future is any time after the present and how we progress towards a specific objective. I think the old policy is yours, future, or your future. Um, Okay, interesting. Now, if I look at the, the man with the virtual reality glasses uh, in the top right-hand corner, well, his future is in his goggles, right? It's in the purview of his goggles. That's, that's, that's what he's seeing. Now, I wonder what kind of virtual reality is streaming to the goggles, but it could be a time about the advancement of the future. It can be a change in direction. I love this. Time is like the river. Yes, it is. It's like the tide. It comes in, it flows. There's a speed, time, distance element to it. And I often talk about rivers and I talk about tides and the ocean. And I think technology should be like this. But currently, it's not that smooth. It doesn't flow that, that rhythmically. Uh, it is more invasive. So the previous slide I showed was simply this one. We are here to talk about the future. Um, and now, and why are we preoccupied with the future? Okay, give me some reasons. Why do we think we are, or why are we preoccupied with the future? We talked about the river. We talked about time. We talked about decades versus 100 years from now. But why are we preoccupied with the future? Why? Any other responses? In the chat window? We are filled with perceptions. That's why we can't see the future clearly. I, I think that's very interesting. Perceptions often govern the future. If the future hasn't happened and we perceive something, well, it hasn't happened yet. We just have a feeling sometimes, but it doesn't mean our perceptions are always accurate. So we can look outside and say, today is a cloudy day, 
or today is cold because we feel it on our bodies or we are looking with our eyes and saying, you know, it's cloudy. We are preoccupied due to uncertainty and the need for progression, says uh, Dr. Robert Abbas. Of course, that is the case. We're preoccupied due to uncertainty. We don't know what the weather's going to be like. We estimate that the weather tomorrow will be 25 degrees Celsius or 20, or it'll be snowing or there will be a monsoon. But we wake up, we look outside, we walk outside, and then we know because it's now. It's not the future anymore. So we are stuck with our past. And we're going to get there. Tell me you're right. Our past does actually dictate what we, where we are today and possibly even where we are going. So we don't want to change ourselves. We don't want to resist. Very interesting thoughts there. But why are we preoccupied with the future? We don't want to change. We're stuck in the past. Yes. Yes, we are. We're stuck even sometimes in the now. The now is overwhelming for us. But let's think about other ideas. Anyone else want to add in the chat or unmute and say something? We ask, why are we preoccupied with the future? There are many possibilities that we can envisage. That's correct. And maybe because we want to make it better. Of course. We want our future and the future of our children the future of our very self and our community to be better. This is something that is innate in human beings. Okay, so if there has been a disaster in an area, if there has been a pandemic that has crippled uh, the societal health, if there has been uh, a natural disaster, if there has been something sad, an event in the community, uh, we wish to make things better. And humans are not always filled with logic, correct? We are filled with emotions. I agree. Most of the time, emotions rule our actions. I think there are many people on the call that would say that. And there are people whose emotions don't dictate their actions. And I think society needs all of these people working together. So why are we preoccupied with the future? We've given some good uh, responses. A, a question here. This is to be provocative. I've gone to the next slide. You should be seeing a man with some cables coming out of his head. Is this your future? And I'd like to hear why it might be or why it is not. So if I ask this question to you, I'm peering into a looking glass. I believe we will fuse with technology. Is this your future? Yes or no? What do you think? I don't see this as our future. Okay, this is one example. And uh, personally, I don't see it as our future either. But there are others who might. Uh, so, saw me. Why don't you see this as our future? What? How do you think about this? And others, please tell me if you think this is our future, because uh, saw me and I could be completely wrong. Uh, is this our future? Is this what you think our future is? Is there anyone you know that thinks this is our future? Any entrepreneurs? Humans have capabilities for innovating something new. Yes, they do. They'll find some way to get rid of this thing, okay, before it, if it ever happens. We now have brain-to-computer interfaces in many parts of the world. Uh, today I saw a documentary through the IEEE Brain Initiative that was talking about I am human, but was questioning humanness through brain-to-computer interfaces, through deep brain stimulation devices, and a lot of new biomedical devices that are supposed to liberate people from ailments. This is in the medical space, but they also pose the question, well, what if this is the future in the non-medical space? So although we are not in the state of doing extraordinary things at the current time, and some engineers will push the boundary and they'll say they're doing very extraordinary things, that in fact, the biomedical marvels are available and possible today. And so the question is, still, is this your future? And if this is not your future, can you tell me in the chat, what is your future? If this is not it, what is it? So we know we can mobilize to do extraordinary things together. But what is it our future? If it's not these cables hanging out of our ears or our head or a, a neural link at the back of our neck, then what is our future in Jaipur? What might it be? Again, these are provocative questions. I'm not expecting you to come out with an answer instantly. 
But if this is not your future or our future, then what is our future? Because before we can innovate, we have to ask these fundamental questions. What is it that we are doing? Why are we engaged in certain technological practices? Why are we innovating towards certain things? What is it that we are trying to achieve? And someone in the previous slide said goals, but what else? Okay, so I don't have a proper argument. And saw me, you don't have to. I think sometimes when we are talking about logic versus emotion, there is some reasoning that occurs as human beings. We have a, a reasoning brain, a reasoning mind is more accurate. But sometimes we are looking for intuition, a reason why. And sometimes that comes from deep within. It does not come from a computation. It does not come from a scientific uh, uh, equation, right? It does not come from discovery in the scientific sense. If we are trying to answer the question, what is our future, or our collective future, sometimes this is not going to come out of an equation like E equals MC squared. Okay, sometimes it's not going to come out of the future hope for quantum computing. It's not going to come, it's going to come from something else. Okay, and maybe it will come from uh, a partial understanding of logic and reasoning. We can measure things around us in the world, but also it will come from within. It must come from somewhere within as a collective consciousness. Where do we want to go as a group? Not just where Katina and Swami want to go, right? as a collective consciousness. So the way we reflect on this in the technology realm is by looking at values in defining our future. If I said to you, what makes Jaipur citizens unique? What might it be in the chat? What are your values in your local community? What do you see as your values in Jaipur? Some of you would be parents, uh, to children, uh, grandparents even, uh, some of you. Camaraderie, yes, yes, exactly. And I, when I visited your country, I always felt this camaraderie. People together in groups, you don't see this everywhere. You don't see this voluntarily in places. I believe this. This is why usually institutions from your area, okay, the students will put on a show. The faculty will participate in the joy of this show. They will be uh, together. Uh, they will uh, have joy together. Jaipur is filled with energy. People from Jaipur like to help each other. This is beautiful. We do our best to help other people. We feed the hungry people. We help the poor. We teach poor students. We celebrate together. Do you know you have so much to offer the world? And if I said to you that these are the fundamental values of a society that is functional, okay, I'm not talking about government systems here. I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about community here. I'm talking about the public interest. And so these values, okay, which energize us, they help us a bit. This is what we want our technologies to imbue. If the technologies are not embedded with the values of our local community, okay, they will be at odds with who we are, with our place. And so I know for some of you, I'm starting at a, at a, at a moment in this discussion, which you might feel is like sociology or social science, but the school I'm part of is trying to embed humanistic values, okay, and value-sensitive design and the participation of the local community in the development and design of technology. So if we don't look to what our value systems are, we are going to adopt values from other places in the world. They may not be in congruence with what we are saying, with what we are feeling. So countries have to do their best in their region instead of fighting with each other. Together, uh, we can. I, I agree. And I think um, when we look at the globe, there is fighting. There is uh, politics involved. There is uh, uh, schisms and breakages in communities. And I often say to my students and my collaborators, if we were all functioning together for the greater development of the university or the greater development of the school or our student development or the development of our local community, 
we would be producing much more effectively. We are all restrained by resources, but if we don't understand the question of what are our values, then what are we going to do? Um, so this is very important. Yes, uh, if people want to annotate, they are welcome. I will move to the next slide. So are our values shared globally? We talked about that very briefly, the difference between shared values and different values, the values that we share as a global community. Sometimes the products that are produced globally be adopted locally, okay? But I know in the uh, very recent uh, uh, local submit, vocally submit work in India, we've seen the government try and empower the people to continue to innovate in the right ways to see India and other neighboring countries progress forward. But we can progress and give the world our technologies that we innovate once we know ourselves. And when our country is so rich in all of the diversity of cultures, this is when it is a huge opportunity for you because you are aware of unity. You know, I visited Kerala in India some years ago and I was amazed that as I would progress down the street, I would see very different cultural icons and cultural points of interest. Everyone was quite happy at the conference together, as we said, hand in hand as a community. The question is, can you sort of bottle this in innovation and then transport your products abroad? The answer is yes. You have something unique to give. It is a melting pot of not only religious belief, but also freedom of different kinds, uh, uh, literacy of different kinds, uh, human inclusion and diversity of different kinds. And this is where I want to encourage you. This is what you can give to the world through this richness. And this is what happens in the values influencing the design process. And it comes back to the human. This is why I have a human here in the right with technology surrounding them. But our values will dictate how this human being will change, how the human will adapt to technology around us. So what about the present? Okay, what's, let's shift now from the future to the now. What does the present tell us and why is it important? Uh, if you'd like to annotate, you're very welcome on this page. Uh, I think I can uh, help you to do that, but you're, you're, you're very welcome. Why is the present important? What about the now? What else is there about the, the, the now? So we are seeing some more comments coming through. Uh, India always tries to help its neighbors. It sure does. We believe in Vasudev Kutumba camp. That's wonderful, which means the whole world in my family. Uh, I was listening to a song about this one family motif today. And we don't have to reach, or sorry, rush in seek of success all the time. We have to find the togetherness. And I will tell you something. This is the truth. This is exactly what I'm saying. I think sometimes we are blinded by the high tech. We are blind, blinded by the advancement. Uh, the present is the reality. Please keep adding to the annotation. Forgive me for not offering you this service earlier. Yes, the present is the reality. Definitely what we said earlier about what is coming tomorrow, you know, is not. 100% real. We, it's not accurate yet, but the present is the reality. You know, a lot of people have been scared by the pandemic. And I say to them, go to your cupboard, open the cupboard door and see whether you can find uh, food in your fridge or in your cupboard. Do you lack resources? You know, and this is very important that the present actually is our reality. You can still decide what to do uh, in the current time. Okay, so the present is the reality. What we do now will decide our future. That is extremely true. Um, and thank you for the signature there, I think, on that page. I'm sorry I can't read that writing. I'm going to go to the next slide. So one of the pertinent issues of our day is um, extremely important. Um, it's to ask ourselves in Jaipur right now, in India right now, what are the pertinent issues? Again, in the chat window, I encourage you to write some things. Think about this. This is a, uh, an exercise in, in sharing. 
what are the most important issues of the day? Because one of the problems that we see in technological development, in the diffusion, in the creation and invention, is that somebody says, ah, oh, there is money here for funding, it's on machine learning and for cybersecurity. And everybody rushes to actually take on the grant and uh, try and become machine learning experts or cybersecurity experts overnight. Rather, how do we come to these issues? How do we understand? And we say, I can do something or I can't do something. So this is exactly where I'm going. What are the pertinent issues of our day? Again, my apologies, I, I can't read that. Um, you, can, you can choose the chat if you wish. So the difference between upper and lower class is the main issue in the current time. Okay, so let's talk about this diversity or inclusion. And the inclusion part is very important. A society may have classes, and this is not something for me to comment on. Rather, what is possible within this classification schema and what is not? How are we to serve each other if that is what the principle or the values we espouse to are? And perhaps at, at different times in history, uh, these principles may be challenged. Okay, it's not for us to debate here uh, on this call, but what is very important is to clearly identify the pertinent issues of the day. Otherwise, we are answering the wrong questions with our technology. Okay, we are following what is happening in the West rather than saying, ah, we've got our own mind in Jaipur. We know what we want, we know what we need. And so the thought experiment I would like you to think about is this. Imagine in your house, there is a crying baby. Now, today, right this second, at the university where you are located, what would you do for the baby to stop crying? Okay, what would you do? You would what? You would pick it up, pat the baby and hug the baby. It's crying, it's loud. You don't, nobody likes to hear babies cry. So if I ask you the question, simply, what do we need today? What would that be in Jaipur? What do we need right now, today? Imagine a baby scenario. Right now, what do you need? Yes, you try to make it laugh, right? Anything to do with that. I'd get a babysitter. Okay. Let's go away from the baby for a moment. In our society, in India, okay, in the world around us, what do we need? I want you to ask yourself and type this very honestly. What do you need today? Has anyone asked you today, what do you need? You woke up in the morning, you came to this talk, you saw your family, you saw your friends, you saw your colleagues. Did anyone ask you, what do you need? I need a will to make it laugh, yes, but not the baby. I'm talking now generally in society. Someone mentioned climate change. It's a, wonder, a wonderful response, right? We need to address climate change as a need today, yes, okay? And a lot of professionals and, and uh, academics in India, everything they are doing is to address this climate change issue. I need to talk, yes, yes. I need to say what I'm thinking. And some we are not allowed to say what we are thinking. And of course, there is protocol. But if I said to you, what material need do you have today? Who will satisfy this need? This is a question. What need do I have today? What are our immediate needs? We have to act. Okay, more tangible. Something, you know, that you don't have, but you need it, right? You might need to buy a new fridge if your fridge broke down. Okay, let's think more now more community driven uh, somebody mentioned the poor before we even educate the poor yes we need food exactly exactly the fundamental things that make us human food shelter clean water okay without these we have no freedom if we haven't if, if our bellies are not full we have nothing right we can innovate technologies all we want we cannot we cannot eat technology Right? We cannot eat technology. Forgive me for biting the phone. But this is the thing. The technology is not going to save us. Right? But technology may save us in a way if it begins to coordinate better food distribution, 
the affordability of food, the traceability of food so there's limited waste, the, the, the need to feed people who are poor. And maybe this is when we look at redistribution and collective pool resourcing, what we do, perhaps our, our caste system dictates that the uh, people in the upper classes eat first, okay? This is the reality of many communities, not just uh, uh, in India, but, you know, in America as well. The wealthy people, they eat. They have no problem eating. They even have the, the surplus issue. They are putting food in the bin. There are these companies called Harvest that go around restaurants, take the food, put them into packaging and redistribute to the poor. This is a wonderful idea, okay, because economics still needs to work. But now we are seeing some responses. Right now we need a vaccine. Exactly. Okay. Right now we need to stop the curb of the COVID-19 transmission. Okay. This is 100% correct. And somehow in Australia, I believe because of uh, the low population, we have been able to get COVID under control. We are an island and quite isolated. Well, other places where migration between states and cities occurs, where there is less availability of personal protective equipment like masks, or there is less ability to track and trace things as they happen, we have numbers that are out of control. This also happens when educational awareness is low. Okay, so this is something that we should all be addressing and mobilizing. I'm forever confused why we are worried about the next generation and upgrade of the phone when we have COVID to face as a community. Our resources need to be redirected into short-term, medium-term, longer-term solutions, okay? And I think we are beginning to understand where I'm coming from here because I'm asking you to step back a second, step back and think, what is technology going to do? So basic things for a better life, proper nutrition, et cetera, et cetera. Health services is a big thing. You know, even in America, we have fantastic health services, but unfortunately the poor don't have access. Okay, there is no safety net for people who cannot afford health. Better education, access to technology. Yes, sometimes people say, oh, everybody has access to technology. That's not true. Some people have better, higher speed access. Some people have mobile phones. Some do not. Okay, some people have smartphones. Some people have feature phones. Okay, how can we distribute? When I throw every six months my new phone away or every two years, how do we distribute the phones, upgrade them, flesh them out, allow people to have access to more powerful technology? So these are all very important critical things. And the other thing is, you know, somebody mentioned a belief system. I think this is critical. Sometimes there is a mismatch between our belief, the meaning of life, and what we are producing. And sometimes, rather than the values coming together and aligning, they are pulling us further and further and further apart. And so I'm not saying that people may not change their belief over time. I'm also not saying there is no freedom in believing whatever you will. But local communities tend to believe in certain things. They may have diversity of belief, like we do in multicultural countries like Australia, New Zealand, and so forth. But this is a very important thing. If I believe in reincarnation, if I believe in heaven, if I believe in some uh, other form of life beyond the current, then that will dictate how I go about invention. If I think the world is temporal, okay, it has a finite lifetime, it will dictate a different design process. Believe me, it will. If I believe after this there is another stage, you know, maybe I don't care about these things so much. Maybe I care about my soul. Maybe I care about purity. Maybe I care about other things. How can technology assist us in aligning our life with principles that we believe in? And they are not disconnected. For example, during the day I do this, and then at work I develop other things. Nothing wrong with mobile phones. But if I believe in a heaven, the mobile phone is not going to get me to heaven, right? This is what I'm saying. This is still material. And so I think if uh, to give to society is a beautiful thing uh, for whoever wrote this down. So what we believe might influence what we build. If we believe in a uh, better society through better bridges, because the bridge will help us get to the other side. 
more efficient traffic, less congestion so we can see more of each other, more communication so we can talk to each other and say, how are you? Let me help you. Let me coordinate with you. But often our belief systems will dictate what we build and what we design. And so the past, right, we can't change that. It's already happened. Okay, there's a history there. We should know our history. We should be aware of our history. And not to labor on that, but going backward is impossible. If I wanted to go to a Wayback Machine, I can go to archive.org, an actual machine that has logged all the web pages of the world dating back to the creation of the web. But in physical nature, I can't go back and change events. I can look to the now and the future to change. And I'm getting to the end of my presentation because I want to ask you, what is the role of technology in our lives, right? It is for better hygiene. You know, years ago, people did not have a toilet to flush. Sewage systems did not exist in many countries, even when we look 100 years ago. All right, what is the next step to hygiene? And we link this to the pandemic for a moment. Better hygiene, the washing of hands, better sanitation, okay, more sanitary products, cleaner air that we breathe in. This is the importance of technology. It's to create a space of cleanliness. But as many scientists and medical professionals have said, we don't want to get that clean that we cannot absorb bacteria and the bacteria, right? So there is healthy bacteria and bacteria that makes us stronger. But it is to make things simple. I agree, whoever said that, it is to make things simple, definitely. The role of technology is not to make things more meshed, more vulnerable to complexity. It's to overcome the wicked problems with clean solutions, but it's also to acknowledge interdependencies in systems. Water powers electricity. Electricity powers telecommunications. Telecommunications powers banking, and banking powers retail, right? We want to go to a Bitcoin solution or to Ethereum or to Bitcoin or, or blockchain. We cannot have everything depending on electronics because electronics also collapse. So by going to the future in advancing, we don't want to leave ourselves destitute and at the mercy of electronics because sometimes electronics falls over. What is the fallback? Okay, if we are going Wi-Fi and broadband and everything electronic, what is the fallback? And also, does this technology actually make us happier? I don't think so. When we look at complexity, complex things make things harder. And so what I want you to do is in thinking about the future, we need to think differently, okay? I want people to take a pause during this pandemic crisis and really honestly think to themselves, what is technology? Do we need to redefine technology? Do we need to concentrate on something called technique? In the ancient times, we didn't have technology. People would die by about the mid thirties. All of a sudden, our life expectancy has grown because of technology. But in this redefinition I'm calling for, because if we create a world of smart surveillance cameras, we are subject to the surveillance. Okay, so we are not immune. If we create a society that is enmeshed in technology, we want to bring the, the technology closer to the brain and embed the technology in the brain, we will become subject to the vulnerabilities of this embedding and intention. So I'm calling for a redefinition of what we suspect technology is. I want us to talk about less about shiny gadgetry and more about coordination, processes, and tasks that come together in activities to produce a cycle that actually betters something, cleaner air, okay? Uh, less climate change as a result of carbon emission lowering down, smart systems to help us achieve these goals, but not smart systems that will bury us in the process of becoming smart. And finally, to tell you and to ask you, what is the public interest? What is this public interest we are saying we are serving with our technology? Yes, these technologies have made us more communicative. They've connected us faster and more than ever before, but they've also made us more addicted. They've also made us more isolated in some cases. They've also made us lonelier. They've also created a lot of mental health concerns, and they've also been a distraction. So here we're trying to weigh up 
technology has benefits. All technology has costs. We have to become more aware when we are building for the public interest. And what I'm advocating for in this talk is public interest technology. And with that, I'd like to say thank you for the time that you've spent listening to me and uh, the patience you've shown with this presentation. I've finished in just under 42 minutes. And I'd like now to open back to you to questions and commentary. Thank you. One very interesting uh, comment which is written in the chat box that is from the Sruti Gupta. Sometimes technology stop us to explore the best out of us. Would you like to say something on this, ma'am? Yes. Yes, friends. Isn't this an amazing thing? We are all computer scientists here, right? And information systems professionals and engineering technologists. We believe in technology. We build it every day. We, we create these things. You know, before I became an academic, I was working in a company that created telecommunications networks. In 1996, I was part of the deregulation of the DOT in India, the Department of Telecommunications. I saw the state circles deregulate and then, you know, incumbent operators fill the market. We had lots and lots of engagement. Uh, we were doing work with Bharti, with Reliance, with all of these different uh, telecommunications providers in this wonderful country of yours. And how is it in this boom, right? In 1996, I was a 20-year-old. In this boom, I thought, this is amazing. Look at all the technologies. In fact, India jumped technologies, if I could say that. They didn't go through the same cycle. You know, in 1995, I was counting telephone per village, right? Now we have the over-proliferation. Some people have more than one mobile phone. They have multiple Internet of Things devices in their houses. Can this stop us from achieving our personal gain, our personal development? I'm going to say, Shruti, Shr 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 I agree with you. Imagine I'm the head of a technology uh, society's transactions. I love technology. Technology helps me to talk to you today. But I think sometimes if we do not separate ourselves from the technologies, and here I show a mobile phone, I don't mean to you we switch it off for a month. This is not feasible in the world we live in. We would be out of a job. We would not be able to communicate and pick up our children. But how can we tame this thing we have unleashed? Because many times we don't understand and don't realize that the duality of technology, all the benefits we are receiving, also sometimes have social implications. This is the IEEE Society I'm part of, the Society on the Social Implications of Technology, SSIT. We acknowledge technology for its advancement of humanity, the tagline of IEEE, but we also acknowledge the externalities, those things that happen that are not in our control. We never meant for them to happen. As somebody mentioned, Dr. Abbas, at the beginning of this presentation, the uncertainty. We live with uncertainty in the world every day. Sometimes it is caused by technology, but then how can we better ourselves with better technology, technology that is there to enhance us in the most important ways, not the ways of like shoving chips in the brain. This we might need if we have a medical prosthetic reason for this. Of course, we're not going to stop this, but before perhaps addressing the needs of smaller populations, and every human is important in the world, every single one. We want to alleviate the pain of every person. How do we use technology to harness other benefits? For example, nobody talks about, this group does, but in many of the communities I've spoken to, they don't think about goodness. How do we develop altruism in the community? How do we coordinate better so that more people eat, less people pass away from uh, uh, sanitation and hygiene issues? This is important. It's in the sustainable development goals. So, friends, I think you asked the right question. You know, technology would, but if it is starting to impact the person, the human being, our senses, our faculties, right? If we are becoming, for example, like I, I, I sit behind the computer typing for hours and hours and hours, I think there is a better way, you know? We have to invent it um, because if we are sitting, we are gaining weight, we are immobile, our body is tense, we are stressed. And when the stress occurs, how can we be good to our community? 
if we can't be good to ourselves or our families. And this is not to make us sad. This is to empower us to know we have the ability to change what's coming next. You know, often I, I'm on the computer, I'm on the phone. Okay, do I expect my kids not to be on the computer and not to be on the phone? I am modeling behavior, but if I'm not being a good model, okay, family, time to go out and we're going to the park or we're going to go to the beach. And I saw you have beautiful uh, surroundings in Jaipur. How can we make good technology that also makes the world better? This is so important. There is another very interesting comment written in the chat box. Uh, that is from Soumya Mitter. Technology may wonder about new generations from their goals. Her goals. Yes. So let's repeat that. Technology may make our life better. It can increase the lifetime of human beings. It has, definitely. Before we had modern hospitals, uh, you know, people would die from the common cold. Penicillin, for example, was only invented during World War II. Uh, a friend of mine who was engaged before he went to World War II, uh, he's now deceased as well, uh, Ron Wilde. His fiance passed away from the common cold, the common flu. And this is because penicillin was not around. And now we have penicillin. But friends, we haven't even come to the, to the capacity of how much drugs, as in penicillin and other antibiotics, we have come to the end of the innovation. Many people now are looking at how can we invent not better drugs because they, the pharmaceutical companies will tell you they have come to the limit of how far antibi antibiotics will help us. Even antipsychotic drugs for mental health issues have come to the limit. We cannot go beyond. We we can in exploring antibiotics and now they are looking at different ways technological ways to overcome some of the common problems in today's world but they are starting to invest in quantified self technologies that look at if i embed a tiny sensor into the pill and the person swallows the pill can we learn more about the behavior of the drug taking of the individual let's just say i have high blood pressure and I'm forgetful. Every day at 5 p.m., I don't take my, my blood pressure pills. Or every day when I wake up at 10 a.m., you know, I don't take my, my blood pressure pills, right? I don't look at the boxes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And so if I have high blood pressure, maybe a transmitter on the pill as it goes through the body can interact with the outside world wirelessly to tell systems, you know, mom or dad forgot to take their blood pressure remind them and the system can monitor states of movement okay if i've been sitting all day which is no no what can get me to get up now the fitbits they can you can set an alarm that says every 30 minutes you should move and i've seen my students when they buy the fitbit they say katina i have the solution um to my obesity i've got the fitbit every 30 minutes i'll be able to move and you know do two minutes of exercise then i can go back to my phd and friends, what happens because the brain is, is, a, is a very interesting vessel, we hear the ping, okay, time to get up, it's been 30 minutes, and we don't move after a while. The novelty effect wears off in the technology. So we need to make better technologies, sometimes to encourage us to move. And I do think there is a duality in technology. Please don't think for a moment that I think technology is bad, just the opposite. What I'm calling for is experts to work on problems that need solving today. And so when I look at cancer, when I look at obesity, when I look at diabetes, when I look at um, pollution, when I look at river systems being polluted, when I look at carbon emissions, these are the things, food insecurity. If this friend, what I want to call technology is the process by which we engage to solve these everyday issues. Because if we don't solve them, we're not gonna be sustainable, right? If we have climate change increasing and changing weather patterns, we may have a cause for natural disasters. We may have a city that's not livable, okay, that most people in the city suffer from respiratory illness like asthma. So what I'm advocating here is the root of our societal issues need to be addressed. 
this is beautiful. This will help us communicate. But I'm finding from the research that a great number of people are addicted, are overusing. Okay, I want to use all the time. Our work situation dictates produce more papers, do more research, more grants. This is the same everywhere. In any country, in any university, we want to innovate more. I'm calling for effective innovation. I want us to think, think before we innovate, not to rush and say this is going to be the salt and grace of the world. Often it isn't. There is another comment. What does innovation mean in terms of social development? This is from Abhishek Sharma. Yes, lovely responses here from all the attendees. Thank you for helping and supporting and, and provoking questions and thoughts. So what does innovation mean? Innovation means discovery. It means something new, something inventive. When we look at patents and definitions and patents, we talk about inventiveness. And so when we look at history and social development, it has gone hand in hand, right? A hundred thousand years ago, man rubbed sticks together, maybe 40,000 years ago, right, to create fire. They wanted to keep it warm. And social development adapted. You know, we look at all the pictures of human species. And they had more hair, they had long beards, they, there was much more for the body to be covered. We know this. We go to museums, natural history museums, and we see this. So we rub the sticks together because if you take your hands and you rub them together in this action, you can feel warmth and, and, and burning, right? Imagine you have two sticks together, you start to see this ashen smoke arise, and then wham, you have lit a fire. By lighting the fire, you can warm your food. You can take food that was hard to eat before because our teeth were really rough and fanged, right? And now we have softer food that we can chew. And so over time, some communities have become less hairy. They've become more fair. Their skin tone has changed. We know this. We've seen migration of humans move to where there was technological capacity, okay? if I had a spear and I wanted to throw the spear at fish to catch the fish, to cook the fish. I had to create the spear. And so initially we looked at those basic necessities and this is what changed society, right? The ability to have fire, the ability to cook food, the ability to put bricks together and to create housing. I guess we call that simple now. In fact, friends, this is technology. Looking at the, the sea, and saying, how can I get to the other land? I see land over there. Okay, we built bridges. We were very inventive. We were very innovative. Now we have the bridges. We have different kinds of bridges, but we have bridges, we have houses. Some people don't. Okay, the equity part of this puzzle is missing. Not everyone has access. We said this before. Not everyone has clean drinking water. Look at Africa. Look at parts of South America. Look at villages in the outposts of India. Okay, how do we bring this equality to the public interest? Everybody wants water. It's a basic necessity. But some of us in some countries are saying brain implants. You know, let's go to Mars. But friends, these are sometimes considered flights of fancy. If not everyone has food, how are we thinking about going to Mars, spending billions of dollars on Mars? when the billions would feed the hungry all over the world 10 times over every year. And so we need to have these discussions. What is our value system? Is it being the first to space with a new CubeSat in India or Australia? Maybe if we believe this CubeSat will somehow liberate all the people, you know? Um, this is where social development and innovation go hand in hand. The last statement I'll make on this, Abhishek, is that the more sophisticated the community thinks it is, the more social development is influenced in asymmetric ways. So if all my community in my neighborhood, and it does, it has access to clean drinking water, 
I go down the street, I don't see a single homeless person. There is no one begging at my local service station when I put gas in the car or petrol. Then what are we left to do? Ah, we are left to create new innovations. Maybe even I'll create a brain implant. Maybe I can download uh, knowledge onto this brain implant. Maybe I can have body area networks. Maybe I can uh, detect when my body will go into seizure if I'm suffering from particular ailments. Maybe I can run diagnostic tests on temperature in Katina and look at ambient temperatures to see when she may fall ill in the coming days and preempt a heart attack, right? So you know what's going to happen. I, I, you know, maybe in the future, all more developed nations, all like nations which have globally developed, the individual may be carrying uh, an ICU, uh, you know, a, a cardiac defibrillator uh, to be there to monitor the heart, right? Because everyone wants to stop a heart attack. So when we developed for need, we develop different things. When we develop, if I can say, for things that are nice to have, we're developing different things again. Okay, so the society dictates what's being developed by need, but not always people can afford. There is another question uh, from Dr. Venu Gopal. In rural areas, what are the profitable wage for innovation in agriculture sector? Would yes, you like to take this? Okay. Very interesting. Thank you, Doctor, for that question. Many. I live in a regional area. It's not the city. Uh, the town I live in has three thousand people. It is surrounded by dairy farms. We have done research on the agricultural sector. I have been to even venture capitalist financial uh, services uh, conferences where they talk about how will agri tech. You know, we talk about fintech. Right? We talk about technology in education sector. Well, what about agri-tech? We can look at soil, right? Influencing the soil with particular fertilizers. Okay, maybe what we are doing is creating applications like they have in Africa to look at fertilizer calculations so that we don't burn the arable land. We don't burn the soil by uh, mixing a fertilizer that is too strong. Okay, this is one aspect. We are looking at large farms with hectares where some people have looked at telemetry systems so that it is more affordable to run a farm. Uh, maybe I'm raising crops. Maybe I want to put traceability systems on the crops. I want to know where the orchard and the fruit gathered from the orchard can go into containers and those containers can go through traceability. Maybe I want to deploy drones to look at uh, the uh, dryness uh, in the grass, you know, you look, you take, you're taking photographs of uh, aridity. Uh, you're looking at water and irrigation. Maybe you want uh, automated irrigation to cover uh, your land so that if you have cattle, for example, or something else on your farm, it is rich and growing and developing. Some people have placed tags, electronic sensors on animals. But again, I go back to this question. What is your value? If you look at a cow as sacred, you don't want to implant the cow with tags, right? So I know that in the West, we have been able to generate more milk in the production cycle of dairy farms and dairy and cattle. We've gone from milking the cow one to two times a day to milking the cow three times a day using technology and feed, uh, looking at troughs so that you allow grain to be given uh, to the animal so that the animal is rich and healthy, okay, uh, to its maximum uh, capacity and output. If it's uh, carrying a child like a, uh, a calf, the cow can also be placed in different quarantine areas so that it can thrive while it is pregnant uh, and ready in, during its gestation. So I will say to you, Values, again, must match. What do you hope to achieve? How do you love the arable land? What is it that you find sacred? You know, in some cultures, the animal or the crop or the place is considered sacred. If I ignore this, 
I ignore the value system of my location, okay? This is why I'm saying to you, all of these ideas about RFID, radio frequency identification, about total farm management, about automated this and that, it's great. But I know many farmers in my com community here in Australia that don't like this technology. They put it on the cattle because the government mandates a radio frequency identification device, right? A national livestock identification device, NLIS system. But they don't want to go and put things in the ear of the animal. They find this difficult. They say it doesn't work. The system doesn't work. So I can tell you lots about agri-tech, about GMOs, right? About soil, about how to create better soil for better crops about sprays that you can put in this is all technology but some people it conflicts with their value system so now you buy at the supermarket organic produce and some people know the organic produce looks and feels and tastes very different to that which has been genetically modified you know although some people don't know the difference but this is also opening up new avenues uh, where you can create almost 3d print food now right imagine this concept you, are, you know, people are buying vegan burgers because it tastes like meat, but it's not meat. Um, so this agri-tech business is exploding at the moment. But I would suggest starting very simply with calculation apps that help you to do the right thing by the soil, and then everything else can come from that, depending on your values. I think we are already running sort of time. So yes. if you permit me, so can we... Take out the last question. Yes, that's a science. Yeah. yeah. The more data we have, the more we can uh, have knowledge of ourselves. And so when we talk about collective awareness, we are not creating data science so that we have better surveillance and so we can put criminals behind bar. You know, this is what the modern uh, notion is of predictive policing, predictive criminal activity. But let's go back to agriculture. If we have climate data, if we can give this to the local farmers and tell them we expect this weather pattern, this time, harvest early because the crops will fail and you will lose your money because a disaster will strike. This is the kind of just-in-time systems we are thinking about when we talk about good data science systems. They will not always be accurate because you're looking at historical data and trying to predict what is coming next. You're trying to create velocity, variableness, and all of these four Vs that we often talk about. But if I could just finish on this point, if we know ourselves better, if we know our place better, through data science, we can create more agile response systems to help us meet our needs and to be more successful as farmers, as educators, as as government officials as everything so data is highly important making it available to everyone is even more important that's hard open data systems uh have some good things and some bad things about them but if you could open these systems up and this data up to the local average person who may not have a technical background is not a computer scientist is not an engineer we are allowing them to tap into resources that they did not have access to before. So thank you so much, and I'm sorry for going over time again. Thank you, ma'am. So we are really very grateful to you. We are humbled, honored, and delighted as we express our earnest appreciation and gratitude towards this very insightful address to our students, faculty members, and outside participants. Your presence itself was a blessing, a privilege for us, and a personal honor for all of us. We are extremely thankful for your gracious presence. We are really very grateful to you, ma'am, and hope the similar kind of support in future also. Thank you very much for your valuable time with us. Thank you so Thank much. You. And you have all blessed me today. My gratitude to each of you, and I hope to see you in the future in person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all Thank the chat and positive friends. Uh, I've been